Good morning. Really glad that you're here. We had a really, really cool event that happened last Monday, our Trunk or Treat event. How many of you guys participated? I can barely see, but I can see movement. There are hands that are up. That is so cool. Thank you. We had uh, about 1,000 people that came through. We gave her out about 40,000 pieces of candy and uh, cooked about 1,000 hot dogs. And it was just a good night, a good night for the church. We had a lot of people from our community come through. And when you participate in something like that, it makes a difference. So thank you. When you supply candy for something like that, we just give you our thanks. It's really a cool thing that you give us the ability to do. Now, according to the Bible, we human beings are made in the image of God. Do you buy that? In the image of God. So, here are three of my grandkids, all right? Jackson, Aubrey, and Caden. Which of these three do you think is closest to the image of God? <laughs> now, they're my grandkids. They've got to come close, right? That's humor. All right. How about these three? Kind of like Halloween fusion. These guys were here on Monday. Scarecrows, witches, and cats. Which of these three do you think best reflects image of God? How about these two sets? Which gets closer? You got wildcats and butterflies, and you got middle school boys, right? <laughs> Space Jam. Which do you think reflects image of God? How about these next three? You got Chucky, Jason, and Mario. Jason and Chucky, image of God. But Chucky's a doll, right? So he doesn't count. But the kid who wore the costume, image of God? What do you think? How about these next two? You have Flamin' Hot Cheetos and Texas Longhorn. That one's easy for me. I honestly don't think God would claim any Texan who doesn't root for the Cowboys. <laughs> Pretty sure. Image of God. Does Thor do it better or Captain Marvel? Medusa or Dorothy? What do you think? So what color is the image of God? How old is the image of God? Male or female? Is it something that you can cover up with a mask or a costume? Is it something that was true once a long, long time ago, but perhaps it has faded over time? Is image of God something that you are or is it something that you do? Or both. Guys, I can't express to you how big, how important this notion is of the image of God. You know, back in college a long time ago, we had to read the book, I'm okay, you're okay. You can look at yourself, you're all right. Look at the person next to you, you're all, they're okay too, and you have a healthy self-image. It's still in print. But I'd love to change the title just a little tiny bit. What if you could actually believe I am image of God and you are image of God. We're both image of God. If you would actually live that out, it would change your life. You see, some of you guys, you think you're worthless. You think you're absolute pond scum and you act that way. And some of you guys look around at some of the people in your life and you think they're worthless. You think they're pond scum. So you treat them that way, right? Well, what if, as badly as we have messed up, what if we are still image of God? And what if, as badly as they mess up, they are still image of God? What if you can still see glimmers of that in them? Do you think God sees it there? So here it is, Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let's make human beings in our image to be like us. They're going to reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, the animals on earth, all the small animals that, critter or that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. Don't miss it. In the image of God, third time, he created them, male and female. He created them. Guys, that is who you are. That's your identity. 
that your real identity as God sees it. Is that cool? Now here's the deal. A lot of people mess this up. Image of God has absolutely nothing to do with your body. It's not about the body that you have. God doesn't have a body. God doesn't need hands and feet and eyes and ears and a nose like we do. He doesn't need a mouth to eat and a belly to process food. He doesn't need body parts to procreate. God speaks things into existence. And you think about it. Animals have bodies too. In fact, if you compare an animal body with a human body, most of the parts are pretty much the same. And they're not image of God. Only we humans are image of God. Image of God is not about these bodies, so it doesn't matter whether you are young or old, male or female, black or white or whatever, pretty or not so pretty. None of these is any less image of God than any of the others, except the longhorn if I put him up there. <laughs> Nor is it chronological. Us older guys are no more image of God than our grandkids. Nor is it characterological. Those of us who are good, we say, are no more image of God than those we think bad. Although every one of us can choose to live it out or not. So what is it, this image of God? Now some guys think it's this reigning over part. They're going to reign over the fish, the birds, the livestock, the animals, small animals. They think it's that reigning part. Maybe God gave us the responsibility to manage this little planet that he's given us, kind of like he manages the whole thing. Maybe that's image of God, stewardship, maybe. Other guys think it has to do with these minds that God has given us. I mean, of all the creatures in this world, we're the ones who can reason best we're the ones who imagine, who wonder, who create, like God did? Maybe. But guys, I think image of God has to do with our will, the free will that God has given us. Of all the creatures on this earth, you guys, we are the only ones who can make moral choices. You understand that? I can choose good. I can choose not good. Animals can't do that. They just follow their instincts. They just follow their desires. Animals are neither good nor evil. They just are, except maybe mosquitoes. They're evil. But a cat's going to toy with a mouse, just being a cat, just a cat. Guide dogs are going to pursue any girl dog that's in heat. They're just dogs. But we choose. We can choose. We can choose to act with our instincts, or we can choose to act against our instincts. We can choose to act with our desires or against our desires, because we are not just animals. We can choose to serve instead of use. We can cho choose to love instead of abuse. We can choose to forgive instead of harbor grudges. We can choose to be godlike, godly, because we bear God's image. This is an amazing gift, this free will. But it gives us the capacity for such evil, doesn't it? But it also gives us the capacity for such good. So why would God give this to us? Because without it, you can't love. And God wants us to love him back. Any parent, any lover knows this. You can't force someone to love you. One guy put it like this. He says, if you're writing a story where love is the goal, if you're writing a story where love is the highest and the best, where love is the point, then you have to allow somebody choice. You have to allow freedom. Guys, God wants us to love him back. So he has to give us the ability to love, choose love, or not. When he created us in his image, it's kind of like he wants us to be his kids, kind of. He created us fundamentally relational, to be in relationship with each other and, of all the creatures on this earth, to be in relation to God, if we choose. You can respond to God or not. You can love God or not, because you are image of God. 
Now, here's the part that some of you guys are going to push back on. That's okay. You could be right, but you're probably not. (laughs) What this means, I think, is that we are the most fully human when we are the most godly, godlike. I am the most fully me. You are the most fully you when you use your free will to choose good like God does. Can you imagine what it would be like for you if you actually used your free will to choose good for God all the time? Can you imagine what it would look like if the people around you actually allowed God to mold them into what he created them to be? Someday I suspect we're going to see some of that. Someday those who are Jesus followers are going to stand before God and he's going to strip us of our flaws. What amazing creatures we could be. Someday you're going to do life with people who've been stripped of their flaws. What an amazing experience that will be. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, all of us who've had uh, this veil, we have this veil in front of us. If we've had that veil removed, now we can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is a spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image, changed into who we were meant to be. It'll be cool. Now, every once in a while, you hear some twit say something like this. Well, I'm only human. I'm only human. I know I'm a jerk, but I'm human. I know I shouldn't have said that. I know I shouldn't have done that, but I'm only human. I know I shouldn't feel that way, but I'm only human, right? And there's some truth to that, I suppose. Because all of us humans choose badly a lot. All of us humans use our freedom to choose badly a lot. But guys, animals have to follow their desires. They have to follow their instincts. We don't. An animal is driven by its nature. We're not. Because we are image of God. So we can choose right when we want to do wrong. We can choose to do life with God, for God, God's way, when it's hard. Because it's good and it's right. Now here's the next piece. As creatures created in the image of God, we can choose to imitate God. To imitate God. Theologians use these Latin words for big ideas like this because it makes them sound smart. We're imago Dei, image of God, so imitatio Dei, be imitators of God. If you want to live out the image of God, imitate Him. Be like Him. Be godly. Like Father, like children, right? Now, guys, this is a huge idea in both the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and the New Covenant, our covenant with God. In the Old Covenant, my favorite verse about this is in the book of Leviticus, believe it or not. Leviticus is a tough book to read, isn't it? Leviticus 19.2. Here's what God says. He says, you've got to be holy. You know why? Because I am. You be holy because your God is holy. Like father, like children right? And it's not a suggestion. That's how to do life with God, for God, God's way, God says. Be like me. Imitate me. Choose love instead of hate. Choose magnanimity and grace instead of hypersensitivity and unforgiveness. Choose to be selfless servants instead of self-absorbed narcissists. You can choose not to use people, to abuse people who are created in God's image, God says. It's right there. In the New Testament, it's found in one of the toughest verses in the whole book. Jesus put it like this. He says, you guys, you guys, this is for you, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Holy cow. Jesus says, you guys, be like God. Be godly, be godlike. And we're, and we're like, but I'm only human. I mess up. And the Bible says every single one of us is sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. No kidding. But that, does that mean that you don't even try 
To be godly, to be godlike, does it mean you settle? Does it mean that you can utter blasphemies like, well, we're just animals, right? I want to be like God. I want to be like me. And God is kind of like, if you want to be fully you, if you want to be the real you, be like me, he says. Imitate me. Like father, like sons and daughters, kind of. And guys, that language is all over the New Testament. It's all over our covenant with God. Jesus says, be merciful, right? Just as God is merciful. Be like him, right? He says, just like I have loved you, in the same way that I have loved you, you guys should love each other. Be different because you're different. Love each other my way, says Jesus, the Son of God. And here's my favorite. This is from the Apostle Paul. He says, imitate God. Be imitators of God, therefore, in everything you do. Because you're his kids. So live a life filled with love like he's God, following the example of Christ. Because that's who you were meant to be. Because you're special. Because you were created in the image of God. Do you believe that? So live that way, guys. Do you have any idea what a difference this would make living this out in our world? Do you understand how living this out could heal a marriage? You were created in the image of God, so do the right thing like he does. Your spouse was created in the image of God, so treat her like you would God's kid. Right? You can do that. You can choose that. I don't care where you've been or what you've done before. You can make that your pattern now. You can choose who you will be today with his help. Do you understand how this could heal your friendships? Be the man. Be the woman God created you to be. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is messed up. Follow God. Be like him. Do you understand how this would heal your workplace, your playground, your social media, for pity's sakes? Your image of God, that's who you are. You're doing life with image of God bearers. So do as he would, treat them as he would, with grace and truth. Hmm. But all that stuff's just preliminary. I haven't gotten to the point yet. Those are big ideas. You're the image of God, so imitate God, right? But we're not yet to where the rubber hits the road. We're not yet to the gut punch. One more step on this little trail. And if you get this step, it should take your breath away. You ready? Well, before we get there, if you're a parent or you're a grandparent, I hope you have dreams for your kids, do you? I suspect most of our dreams for our kids and our grandkids would be similar, I hope. I hope if you're a Jesus follower, the number one dream you have for your kids or your grandkids is that they live and die as genuine Jesus followers. Is it? Is there anything more important to you than that? And if that's not number one for you, what's wrong with you? I fear it's not the number one dream for some. We don't always live that way. But if you actually believe that there is a big G God and if you believe that in a hereafter that is governed by your relationship with that big G God, then what in the world would be more important than doing life with God, for God, God's way for now and for forever, right? You know, it's hard for me to rank the other dreams we have for our kids. I don't think any of them is negotiable. I'd love for my kids and my grandkids to have good marriages, wouldn't you? I'd like them to be deeply in love with their mates. I want them to be stronger and happier together than they would be separate. I want them to treat each other with respect, and I hope that they never quit on each other. How about you? I'd like them to raise a decent family. I, I, I think children can bring a richness to life, and I hope they have a loving relationship with their kids. I want their children, my grandchildren, to love and respect and obey their parents without wars. And I especially want my grandchildren to love their papa, right? That's big. 
and I'd like my children to do something productive with their lives. Whatever they choose to do, I don't care. Whatever God nudges them to do, I want them to make a difference for good with their life, in their families, in their churches, in their community, in their world. You want that for your kids, grandkids? I want them to conduct themselves with honor on their jobs. I want Andy and Stephen and Jackson and Caden to be real men, men of honor, men of courage, men of integrity, men of God. I want Alethea and Morgan and Aubrey to be real women, women of honor and courage and integrity, women of God. Do you want that? And I think one of my deepest desires for all of them is that they find a genuine friend, a good friend. What I mean by that, a friend who is good, maybe even a few genuinely good friends. I don't think there's much more important than that. I don't want them to be lonely. I want them to have friends who will stick with them no matter how tough it gets, no matter how badly they mess up, who will speak to them God's truth with God's grace. And I think maybe the most important part of having a genuine friend will be their their own willingness to be a genuine friend. I want them to be able to live outside themselves. I want them to be able to love others as much as they love themselves. You want that for your kids? I want them to face times of crisis with strength and peace. I wish they'd never have any crises, but that would be a pipe dream in in this broken world. So I hope they find that inner strength based on their faith in God to face with courage the hard times that are ahead. You want that for those you love, don't you? I want them to have fun. I want them to enjoy life. I want them to live life with a zest. I hope they'll never take themselves too seriously, but they'll always have a a keen wit and an ability to laugh. I want to hear those I love laugh with God-honoring laughter. Don't you? And I hope that they'll grow old gracefully. Because a lot of times people grow old ungracefully with cynicism and bitterness and anger. I hope my kids and my grandkids grow more and more lovely as they get older. Now, think about it. Do you think God wants this stuff for his kids? Do you think God wants this stuff for you? Do you think the big G God wants these things for you? Do you think he has dreams for his kids? Do you think he has dreams for you? Do you think the number one dream that God has for you is that you will do life with Him, for Him, His way, forever? I mean, a dad wants to do life with his beautiful but messed up kids. And if you don't think God wants that for you, how do you explain the cross? Do you believe that God, your dad, wants you to have a good marriage? Solid marriage, good, strong family, that he wants you to be deeply in love with each other, to be stronger together than you would be alone, that you would never quit on each other. Do you think God wants you to live your life in such a way that you're going to make a difference for good in your world? Why do you think he's given you all the gifts that he's given to you? For your glory or to bless those that need what you have been blessed with? I mean, he made us to need each other, guys. Do you think God wants you to find some genuinely good friends? Do you think God wants you to be a genuine good friend? Do you think God wants you to face times of crisis, which are going to come with strength and with courage and peace? I mean, what good parent doesn't want that kind of thing for his kid? Do you think God wants you to enjoy life? to experience beauty, to laugh. I mean, what's more precious to a parent than the belly laugh of a child? Isn't that that way for God too? Now listen, to achieve these dreams, God says, be like me. To achieve these dreams, to make these dreams come true, he says, be like me, imitate me. Because that's where I'm trying to take you, God says. 
like father, like sons and daughters, for the best life possible in this world and the next. Imitate me, God says. In fact, that's one of the huge reasons that Jesus stepped into our world, to show us how to be fully human, fully God and fully human. So God says, imitate me. You know why? Because he wants the best for his kids. Do you buy that? Now, here's the gut punch. Don't lie. Do you want your kids to have the best life possible? Do you want your grandkids to have the best life possible for now and for forever? Are you serious? Or are you lying? Because if you're serious, you're going to tell your kids and your grandkids, be like me. Imitate me. Let me show you how it's done. Hmm. Let me show you some of the most challenging words in the whole Bible. They were spoken by the Apostle Paul, but I think they should be your words. The words of every single one of us in this room. Paul says, imitate me. <laughs> imitate me. Holy cow. Follow me, he says. Now at first read, those are some of the most arrogant words a man could speak, right? I want you to be like me. I want my kids, my grandkids, my friends, my neighbors, my enemies. I want you all to be like me. Could you say that? How would your world look like if everyone around you was like you? For some of us, that'd be terrifying. Especially since the Apostle Paul was a really bad guy, sometimes. If you were looking for a reason to cancel somebody, Paul would give you a boatload of them. He calls himself the chief of sinners. In other words, he was good at sin. Hunted down Jesus' followers, jailed them, watched them die. He was awful. Even after he's a Jesus follower, he says this, I, I want to do the good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, and I still do it anyway. And then he has the audacity to look you in the face and says, be like me. But I cheated. I only read you the first half of what Paul said. I yanked it out of context. That's bad. What he actually said is, you should imitate me just as I'm trying to imitate Christ. Imitate me as I follow Jesus. Follow me as I try to follow Jesus. I know I'm going to mess up a lot, guys. I know I'm going to fail him, and I know I'm going to fail you, but I'm never going to quit trying to follow Jesus. Can you say that? Because your kids and your grandkids are going to imitate you, whether you like it or not. So are they going to see you trying to follow Jesus or not? And when you fail, are they going to see you getting up and trying again? Are they going to see a real man? Are they going to see a real woman? Are they going to see a full human in the image of God trying to live that out? You see, you are the most fully human when you're the most God-like, the most godly. So are you going to try to let those you care about see what a real man or a woman real woman looks like even when you mess up which we do a lot are they going to see us get up and try to get back on that trail because guys that's going to be your most powerful sermon ever it's not going to be about what you say it's going to be about what they see you do here's what that means it means that if I want my kids and my grandkids to live and die as Jesus followers then they had better see me live and die as a Jesus follower you too. It means that if I want them to have a good God-honoring marriage, then I'd better love my wife and treat her right and never quit on her. You too. It means that if I want them to do something significant with their lives, then I had better live for something bigger than myself, my hobbies, or my addictions. You too. It means that if I want them to have God-honoring values, then I had better be a man of courage Honesty, forthrightness, integrity, compassion, and love. They had better see me try to live out truth and grace. You too. It means that if I want them to have good friends, I need to show them what a good friend looks like. It means if I want them to face their crises with strength and peace, then I had better learn how to trust God, right? How to call on His courage and strength. 
It means that if I want them to enjoy life, then I better show them how to laugh, how to embrace life with zest and humor. You too. It means that if I want them to grow old gracefully, then I'd better never stop growing as a Christian. Never. It means that I need to show how God's Spirit is building me into the image of Christ till the day I die, trying to get me to think more like Him and feel more like Him and act more like Him. You too. Guys, this stuff is not optional for a Jesus follower. You were created in the image of God. To be fully you, to be fully human, you need to be like Him. You'll never be a God, but you can be godly for the very best life possible. And that's not only for your very best life possible, it's for the very best life possible for all of those following in your footsteps because they're watching you guys. And our job is to give them the best chance that we can give them. Do you believe that? We need to spend just a couple of minutes in prayer. Because guys, this is hard. This is our task. This is who we are. It's who we're called to be. So let's tell God that we're willing to, to give it our best shot. Why don't you pray with me? Father, too often we don't We don't try to imitate you. We just do what we want. 